the financial centers of the world. This is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. You got some vax worries here on this Tuesday. Moderna's CEO warning of Omicron could evade existing vaccines, and Regeneron says its antibody is less effective against the variant. The S&P lower on this risk-off day. But by the dip, J.P. Morgan says the new variant won't derail that global equity rally. We're going to talk to Lori Calvacina, RBC Capital Markets, to get her view. And the rate hike chorus. Bank of America joining Goldman in predicting three Fed hikes in 2022. Starting in June, we will bring you day one of Powell and Yellen's testimony to Congress. From New York, I'm Alex Steele with my co-host in London, Guy Johnson. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Guy, I also have to wonder, this is the last trading day of November as then we enter that yep. shortened December. And I wonder how much of that is also playing into the price action. I think it's definitely part of it. It is something that you want to think about. I'm keeping an eye on what's happening with volatility because that's going to have a meaningful impact on risk. That is being whipsawed. Clearly, there is a huge debate about what that rate hike story is going to look mm -hmm. like. Uh, there is clearly a pain trade right now that everybody's trying to work out, but a lot of people being squeezed. It's interesting what's happening at the front end of the curve. Keeping an eye on Brent as well. We're going into OPEC. That's going to be a story to keep an eye on. Yep. Some are saying that because we're seeing so much buying in the belly of the curve, that actually could indicate that 2023 hikes might be more off the table. 2022, okay, we'll see the hikes, but then we kind of stop a little bit, which I also thought yep. was quite interesting. Let's talk about the data that we're getting, consumer confidence. Now, this is data for November. This is before we started to see a meaningful pickup in the Delta variant, and it's before we obviously started talking about Omicron. Uh, but nevertheless, the data uh, coming through, dipping a little bit um, in terms of the headline number. We're at 109.5. Uh, the prior number also revised a little bit lower as well. So the prior number, 113, revised to 111. The survey for this time round was 110. Uh, that's the headline number. Present situation, 142, that's down from 147, which has been revised lower to 145. Expectations drop quite sharply, actually, versus the unrevised number of 91.3, but that's been revised to 89. We've now got to print expectations-wise of 87.6. Alex, the consumer's starting to get nervous. Now, this could be because of what is happening with the, with the virus, uh, but it may also be because of inflation and what is happening with wages and the whole inflation mm -hmm. and the income squeeze. So you wonder what's playing into this. Yeah, and you think November, maybe that was about uh, inflation, but maybe December's consumer read is going to be more about yep. what's happening with the virus. Uh, and to that point, Moderna said uh, in an FT op-ed that the new vaccine to fight the Omicron variant could be ready by early 2022 if required. The company's top executives reiterated that the variant's mutation suggests that a new vaccine will be needed. I definitely think that this threat it's something that we have not seen before. Uh, the number of variations, mutations on this virus are surprising. Uh, they're not theoretically impossible, but extremely rare. And so we have to take it for the serious threat that it poses. Joining us now is Eric Fanner, Bloomberg Managing Editor for Global Business. Eric, why is the market taking this particular point so negatively when we all knew that potentially we could have extra boosters for this? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, there's a bit of a glass half empty, glass half full thing going on with every utterance that the vaccine makers are are making at this point. We also had comments from AstraZeneca this afternoon kind of saying, you know, look, there's no evidence at this point that our vaccine won't work against the new variant. Um, and that was interpreted in a slightly different way from Moderna's comments that were seen more negatively. I mean, as, as the executives there have said, you know, all along, we've known that at some point a variant might come along that would defeat these. We don't know at this point. Um, all the vaccine makers have said, no, look, it's going to take a couple of weeks to, to find this out. Bear with us. We'll have more information. But of course, in that vacuum, you're going to have a lot of speculation. You're going to have a lot of people placing bets one way or the other. As that's happening, though, Eric, we're also seeing a significant pickup in Delta variant numbers, uh, both in the United States and here in Europe. Europe seems to be the epicenter of that story. What can you tell us about what governments are doing right now to deal with the immediate threat? Well, there's some things happening that, you know, would have been seen as pretty extraordinary just a few weeks or a few months ago. You've got some pretty strict mandates coming in. I mean, it started in Austria with the vaccine mandate they proposed there. Um, Greece today proposed fining people, you know, over $100 per month if they don't get a, a vaccine. Um, and uh, in Germany, there's also talk of, uh, you know, some of stricter measures. Uh, we're seeing this kind of 
kind of a groundswell, really, um, in, in a few places uh, that, that, you know, governments are, they're, they're running out of patience with people who haven't gotten the vaccines and they're taking, you know, whether it's threats or, or action, uh, the steps are, are, are starting yeah. to, to, to be pretty strong. Yeah, I, I think Greece is like finding people uh, over $100 uh, for those who aren't vaccinated over 60 um, each week, I think. Uh, Eric, um, the return to office narrative, uh, getting back to normal, fully reopening, is that 100% off the table for the winter? Well, I mean, certainly in the short term, you'd have to expect there'd be some hiccups. I mean, um, but, you know, what happens next, you know, with the, with the vaccines, I mean, it'll, it'll be hard to tell. I think at the moment, people have been pretty committed to kind of this flexible model anyway, as you can see, you know, uh, people working from home or the office, uh, depending on the day. And, um, you know, you'd have to think that'll continue. I, we, in London, we already had some, some pretty good numbers over the last few weeks of offices being pretty, you know, being pretty full but that hasn't been reflected everywhere. Yeah, I would say just anecdotally, trains last couple of days, definitely a little bit quieter. Mm -hmm. That may be due to the weather. Eric, thank you very much indeed. Bloomberg's Eric Fanner, greatly appreciated. Um, Boris Johnson, out of interest, is going to speak alongside Shazid, Shazid Javid, uh, his health secretary, can't speak today, um, on what is happening in the UK a little bit later. We're going to get that 11 Eastern, 4 p.m. here in the UK. Concerns about the efficacy of existing vaccines uh, against Omicron, certainly putting the markets in risk-off mode. Uh, investors debating whether it's time or whether we should wait to buy the debt. I've seen this economy and the stock market weather all kinds of turbulence over the years. And essentially every material downturn in the market was a good buying opportunity. And I suspect this will be just the same. Of course, see that, that buy, the, uh, buy the dip mentality. As long as those underlying fundamentals of the job market, personal income, corporate earnings and corporate profit margins are headed in the right direction, that tide is still coming in. And yes, we would be a buyer of any dips. The strength of the correction that we saw on Friday is an indication of how weak the conviction is in a stronger economy. People feel like they have to be invested in the market. These retail investors are very aggressively buying the dip still, and I see that continuing for a while. Let's bring another voice into the conversation. Laurie Calvacino, RBC Capital Markets, head of U.S. Equity Strategy. Laurie, great to see you. Uh, we're obviously seeing a lot of volatility right now, but ultimately... Does it end up in the same place, i.e. the market buys the dip? I think so. I think it's a question of, you know, how low it goes from here. Does it go lower from here? I wouldn't be entirely surprised if Friday turned out to be the lows. Um, but I think the reality is one of the, the guests you just quoted a moment ago mentioned she hadn't mentioned retail investors. I don't know that they've stepped in to buy the market in a big way yet. If you look at the AAII survey from last week, they had actually taken a bearish step even before this news came out. So I think that's one positive underpinning of support that's still yet to come. Um, and when we look at institutional investors, you know, I think they're taking mostly a wait and see approach at this point in time. We did a survey yesterday afternoon um, and after Biden spoke, and we found that most people in our survey said they're not really doing anything with their portfolios yet. They need more information. Um, so I think sentiment is a precarious thing, but I think you are right. I think we're going to end up in the same place with buying the dip. I think it's the near term that's a bit uncertain. Also, Lori, uh, um, I did find your survey quite interesting, but I guess the question really becomes, what do they do? What do they buy? Yeah. So if they're not going to buy the dip yet, when they do, what's it going to be? So if you look at Friday's price action versus yesterday's price action, you saw two very, very different markets. Friday was, you know, kind of panic and fear and defensives floated to the top, things like healthcare and staples. And yesterday we saw the secular growth oriented sectors like technology do quite well. And we're seeing that in early trading again today. And I think at least while we're in this information vacuum, while we're trying to figure out exactly where this virus is headed, this variant is headed, I think investors are going to not go back into defensives. I think they're going to go back into what they were buying yesterday and this morning. They're going to stick with tech, consumer discretionary, and those sorts of things. And we saw actually really interesting tidbits of this in our survey. Among those who are actually doing something with their portfolios, and it's, it's a minority, um, but it was sort of split between those who said they're buying secular growth and quality, around 20% of the survey respondents. And then there was another bunch, similar percent, that was buying cyclical. So you have a camp that's buying the dip, and they are split between whether or not they're buying aggressively or buying cautiously. My money is on cautious buying for at least the next few weeks. Laurie, we're going to hear from the Fed chair in just a moment, speaking on Capitol Hill. Do you think he's got the markets back? 
I think investors are confused about where the Fed is going. I mean, that's something we probed in our survey as well, just to figure out what the market's pricing in. And we found that almost half think that there's going to be no impact on the taper. In terms of hike, we found that there's a decent a minority, around 20% or so, again, that think that hikes get pushed back. But we also saw a similar number who said that it wouldn't. So I think we're going to take a lot of cues off today's testimony. Yeah, and we'll get deeper into that uh, in just a moment. Um, I wonder, Lori, you mentioned sort of what they're going to buy on the dip. But over the next four weeks, we're going to have some rebalancing into the end of the year. And typically, we talk about that Santa Claus rally. And I want to know kind of what you think these next four weeks uh, are going to bring. Are we going to see more of sell the winners kind of thing? I think we're going to see people grow back into the longer term structural winners, which is going to be sort of the tech stocks, the Internet stocks. Um, some of those big kind of secular growth oriented consumer discretionary names. You know, we've seen areas like energy and financials have quite a good year. Um, I don't necessarily think that you're going to see people, you know, kind of trying to buy some of those trades on very recent weakness. I think people are really going to be focused on just sort of the longer term stocks that they happen to like and look and look for safety in those kinds of names. I don't know if we'll see that kind of typical like leaders laggards trade like we normally see. Mm. What about the financials in all of this, Laurie? The financials are host held hostage to bond yields. I mean, that's really all you yep. need to know about how that sector is going to trade relative to the broad market. Mm -hmm. um, and I wish, you know, as a strategist, I could give you better color than that. They're super cheap. I think that they look great outside that bond yield issue. And I think once the value trade gets going again, it's going to be a fantastic place to be. But I do think that it could be challenged in the short term. Yeah. You know, one thing that we've seen historically, value doesn't work when COVID cases are rising. Uh, what about oil? Oil, I think, is even, you know, a little bit more challenged in the short term than, or I would say the energy sector rather, um, than the financials. Because I do think that, you know, sort of regular investors are willing to make bets in financials. But I think that energy just tends to get caught up in kind of the oil macro trade. And so when you're really scared on the macro, that is an easy place to pull some funds. Fair enough. All right, Lori uh, Calvacine of RBC Capital Markets, you'll be sticking with us. We're going to get more into the Powell and Yellen testimony. The Senate Banking Committee Chairman Sherrod Brown uh, is currently giving the opening statements. We're going to bring you uh, those te testimony of the Senate Banking Committee later on in the hour. This is Bloomberg. The economic emergency has passed. Earlier this month, I was glad to see the Fed finally announce a long overdue taper of its bond buying program. Quantitative easing should be used in emergencies only and we are well past the need for such support. Including by providing free preschool, free paid leave, free childcare, just to name a few. Democrats are attempting to hide the unprecedented enormity of this tax and spending spree through budget gimmicks. To the that was Senate Banking Committee Budget ranking Budget member, House Senator House. Patrick Toomey. He is speaking right now. We are awaiting Fed Chair Jay Powell and Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's testimonies uh, in the front of the Senate Banking Committee. We want to bring in Bloomberg Economics and Policy Correspondent uh, Michael McKee. Mike, we got the statements. What stood out to you? What are you looking for? Not a whole lot stands out in the statements because both the Treasury Secretary and the Fed Chair are trying to be as circumspect as possible because as you've repeated over and over again on the show, in the immortal words of William Goldman, the screenwriter, nobody knows anything about this new variant yet. We're still waiting to find out. So the question is, how hard does Jay Powell push back on the idea that the Fed is going to taper faster, or does he push back at all? Take a look at his statement today, and you see all this. Poses risks, increased uncertainty, could reduce, would slow. A lot of conditionals in there as the Fed chair tries to keep his options open. And here's why. Unlike Mr. Market has to trade every minute of every day, the Fed does not have to make a move every day. Their next meeting is December 15th. And here's a fact the Fed sees, which you could probably expect Jay Powell to talk about today. The U.S. economy has performed better during each successive wave of the coronavirus. And so if that's going to be the case, then the Fed isn't going to be as concerned with what happens. You can see there the... Uh, Ah, well, I understand that uh, the Treasury Secretary is cutting me off. Almost. Almost. Uh, that's almost. right. We're, we're looking at uh, the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, give, delivering her testimony to the Senate Banking Committee. To pass the largest infrastructure package in American history. November 5th, it turned out, was a particularly consequential day because earlier that morning we received a very favorable jobs report. 531,000 jobs added. It's never wise to make too much of one piece of economic data, 
But in this case, it was in addition to a mounting body of evidence that points to a clear conclusion. Our economic recovery is on track. We're averaging half a million new jobs per month since January, and GDP now exceeds its pre-pandemic levels. Our unemployment rate is at its lowest level since the start of the pandemic, and our economy is on pace to reach full employment two years faster than the Congressional Budget Office had estimated. Of course, the progress of our economy, of our economic recovery, can't be separated from our progress against the pandemic. And I know that we're all following the news about the Omicron variant. As the president said yesterday, we're still waiting for more data, but what remains true is that our best protection against the virus is the vaccine. People should get vaccinated and boosted. At this point, I'm confident that our recovery remains strong and is even quite remarkable when put in context. We should not forget that last winter, there was a risk that our economy was going to slip into a prolonged recession. And there is an alternative reality where, right now, millions more people cannot find a job or are losing the roofs over their heads. It's clear that what has separated us from that counterfactual are the bold relief measures Congress has enacted during the crisis, the CARES Act, the Consolidated Appropriations Act, and the American Rescue Plan Act. And it's not just the passage of these laws that has made the difference, but their effective implementation. Treasury, as you know, was tasked with administering a large portion of the relief funds provided by Congress and under those bills. During our last quarterly hearing, I spoke extensively about the state and local relief program, but I wanted to, to update you on some other measures. First, the American Rescue Plan's expanded child tax credit has been sent out every month since July, putting about $77 billion in the pockets of families of more than 61 million children. Families are using these funds for essential needs like food. And in fact, according to the Census Bureau, food insecurity among families with children dropped 24 percent after the July payments, which is a profound economic and moral victory for the country. Meanwhile, the Emergency Rental Assistance Program has significantly expanded, providing much needed assistance to over 2 million households. This assistance has helped keep eviction rates below pre-pandemic levels. This month, we also released guidelines for the $10 billion State Small Business Credit Initiative Program, which will provide targeted lending and investments that will help small businesses grow and create well-paying jobs. As consequential as November was, December promises to be more so. There are two decisions facing Congress that could send our economy in very different directions. The first is the debt limit. I cannot overstate how critical it is that Congress address this issue. America must pay its bills on time and in full. If we do not, we will eviscerate our current recovery. In a matter of days, the majority of Americans would suffer financial pain as critical payments like Social Security checks and military paychecks would not reach their bank accounts, and that would likely be followed by a deep recession. The second action involves the Build Back Better agenda. I applaud the House for passing the bill, and I'm hopeful that the Senate will soon follow. Build Back Better is the right economic decision for many reasons. It will, for example, end the child care crisis in this country, letting parents return to work. These investments, we expect, will lead to a GDP increase over the long term without increasing the national debt or deficit by a dollar. In fact, the offsets in these bills mean they actually reduce annual deficits over time. 
Thanks to your work, we have ensured that America will recover from this pandemic. And now with this bill, we have the chance to ensure America thrives in a post-pandemic world. With that, I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, thank you, Secretary Yellen. Chair Powell, you're recognized. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, and other members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. The economy has continued to strengthen. The rise in Delta variant cases temporarily slowed progress this past summer, restraining previously rapid growth in household and business spending, intensifying supply chain disruptions, and in some cases, keeping people from returning to work or looking for a job. Fiscal and monetary policy and the healthy financial positions of households and businesses continue to support aggregate demand. Recent data suggests that the post-September decline in cases corresponded to a pickup in economic growth. And GDP appears on track to grow about 5% in 2021, the fastest pace in many years. As with overall economic activity, conditions in the labor market have continued to improve. The Delta variant contributed to slower job growth this summer as factors related to the pandemic, such as caregiving needs and fears of the virus, kept some people out of the labor force despite strong demand for workers. Nonetheless, October saw job growth of 531,000 and the unemployment rate fell to 4.6 percent, indicating a rebound in the pace of labor market improvement. There is still ground to cover to reach maximum employment for both employment and labor force participation, and we expect progress to continue. The economic downturn has not fallen equally, and those least able to shoulder the burden have been the hardest hit. In particular, despite progress, joblessness continues to fall disproportionately on African Americans and Hispanics. Pandemic-related supply and demand imbalances have contributed to notable price increases in some areas. Supply chain problems have made it difficult for producers to meet strong demand, particularly for goods. Increases in energy prices and rents are also pushing inflation upward. As a result, overall inflation is running well above our 2% longer run goal, with the PCE price index up 5% over the 12 months ending in October. Most forecasters, including at the Fed, continue to expect that inflation will move down significantly over the next year as supply and demand imbalances abate. It is difficult to predict the persistence and effects of supply constraints, but it now appears that factors pushing inflation upward will linger well into next year. In addition, with the rapid improvement in the labor market, slack is diminishing and wages are rising at a brisk pace. We understand that high inflation imposes significant burdens, especially on those less able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. We are committed to our price stability goal. We will use our tools both to support the economy and a strong labor market and to prevent higher inflation from becoming entrenched. The recent rise in COVID-19 cases and the emergence of the Omicron variant pose downside risks to the employment and economic activity and increased uncertainty for inflation. Greater concerns about the virus could reduce people's willingness to work in person which would slow progress in the labor market and intensify supply chain disruptions. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. At the Fed, we'll do everything we can to support a full recovery in employment and achieve our price stability goal. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I Secretary Yellen, thank you for your comments about uh, on, the, on the debt ceiling. We have two more weeks. We know failing to get this done will hurt families and small businesses and our whole economy. I want to ask you about something else, though. The Wall Street Journal reported two weeks ago that two-thirds of the largest publicly traded companies had larger profit margins in 2021 than in, 2020, than in 2019 before COVID-19. In 2020, top CEOs made 351 times 
of the income that a typical worker made. Even during an ongoing pandemic, when faced with increased demand and supply chain issues, big corporations refused to cut their own profits. They raised prices on people. They complained about having to pay workers more, never mind the fact they've been giving themselves raises for years without it impacting their prices. Meanwhile, the costs of housing and medical care and almost everything else for most workers has been rising for years. You've said, Secretary Yellen, you said the bipartisan infrastructure bill and Build Back Better will bring costs down for most Americans. Could you explain that? Yes. Um, the Build Back Better plan um, contains support for households um, to help address some of the most burdensome and most rapidly rising costs that they face. For example, the cost of child care which is virtually unaffordable for many American families. Um, there are subsidies for quality child care that will bring down the cost for the great majority of American families. Um, universal um, pre-K for three and four year olds. Um, those, um, and, and a child tax credit. And all of that will bring down the cost of child care. And for families that are facing crushing burdens, for example, uh, rental, very high rental costs in many areas, the additional money that um, they get through the child tax credit will help them uh, keep a roof over their families' heads. And um, as I indicated in my opening remarks, is already helping them uh, put food on the table. Um, with respect to uh, the costs of caring for uh, the elderly, uh, Build Back Better contains support for those who are disabled and the elderly to get care in their homes. Um, there, there are subsidies, an increase in the Pell Grant, and um, money for education and for workforce training that will make that more affordable, and um, reductions in the cost of prescription drugs. These are some of the most burdensome um, items in family budgets, ones that have risen more rapidly than the general level of prices over time. And um, the, the bill will uh, help families um, meet those, meet those uh, burdensome expenditures. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam, Madam Secretary, uh, Mr. Chair, Chair Powell, is it, your, is it still your belief that higher prices in certain sectors are chief, chiefly caused by the upheaval we're experiencing as a result of the global pandemic? And then as the pandemic eases, so too should inflationary pressure? So I, I guess I would say it this way. Um, generally, the higher prices we're seeing are related to the supply and demand imbalances that, that can be traced directly back to uh, the pandemic and the reopening of the economy. But it's also the case that, that price increases have spread much more broadly in the recent few months uh, across the economy. And I think the risk of, of higher inflation has increased. Okay, thank you. The, um, the dollar is, this is a question for both of you, the dollar is controlled by the American people, but stable coins are controlled by opaque, secretive technology companies over and over on issue after issue. We've seen tech firms put profits ahead of the public interest with our elections, with our privacy, with competition in our markets. Is it risky, and start with you, Madam Secretary, is it risky to let control over our money fall into the hands of these companies? I believe that um, stable coins can result in some um, greater efficiencies in the payment system and um, could contribute to um, easier um, and more efficient payments, but only if they're adequately regulated. And um, the president's working group uh, that I chair recently issued a report uh, indicating that there are significant risks associated with these currencies, um, risks of 
to the payment system, risks of runs, and risks related to the concentration of economic power. And we have called upon Congress to put in place for these stable coins um, a, a regulatory framework that would make them safe um, and protect consumers and um, put them on a level playing field with um, other other providers of similar services, such as banks. Chair Powell, do you agree with that? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. I, I, in closing out my time, I think it's important to look at a bit of historical perspective, as both of you have explained to me in other conversations in the late 90s and early 2000s, over-the-counter derivatives and subprime mortgages were billed as financial innovations. Financial regulators at the time pushed to weaken safeguards, saying that a cloud of legal uncertainty hung over the OTC derivatives markets and regulations, again, their words could discourage innovation and growth and drive transactions offshore. Later, the banking lobby argued that regulating subprime mortgages would decrease borrower choice and reduce access to capital. The Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission cited derivatives and subprime mortgages as key factors in the crisis. It looks again, 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 like the financial industry uses these same arguments for stable coins and decentralized finance platforms. Today, all of us on this committee and both parties should be concerned about that, should understand the historical parallels, and should listen to this very bipartisan panel, the Secretary of the Treasury and the Chair of the Federal Reserve, uh, Senator Toomey. Thank you, Mr. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since the topic of the debt ceiling came out, let me just remind all of us of something that we know very well, and that is our Democratic colleagues can raise the debt limit all by themselves anytime they want, and there's nothing Republicans could do to stop them. The tools have been available to them all year long. And in fact, Republicans have offered to expedite the process. There is only one reason that our Democratic colleagues refuse to use reconciliation to raise the debt limit. And that is because they would have to specify the amount of debt they want to inflict on the American economy. They want to avoid accountability for this terrible spending spree they're engaged in by obfuscating and not specifying a dollar amount. I think we should be very clear about what's going on here. Uh, Mr. Powell. Under the Fed's new flexible average inflation targeting, the inflation target remains at 2%, but now it's on an average over an unspecified time frame. Core PCE, the Fed's preferred inflation metric, is running about above 2% over the past five years, nearly 3% over the past two years, and 4.1% over the past year. So it's above target, it has been above target, and it's accelerating. And yet the Fed has maintained an extraordinary emergency monetary policy stance. It looks to me like this framework appears to be a weakening of the Fed's commitment to stable prices. Now, I know you believe this is transitory, but everything's transitory. Life is transitory. How long does inflation have to run above your target before the Fed decides maybe it's not so transitory? Well, um First of all, the, the, the test that we've articulated, I think, clearly has been met now. Uh, you know, you, you're absolutely right. Inflation has run well above 2 percent for long enough that uh, if you look back a few years, inflation averages 2 percent. So I think, I think we can say that that, that is taken. It was not the case going into this episode. It had been many years since we had inflation at 2 percent. Um, so I think the word transitory has different meanings to different people. To, to many, it carries a time, a sense of, uh, of short-lived, we, we tend to, 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 to ha use it to mean that, that it won't leave a permanent mark uh, in, the, in the form of higher inflation. I think it's, it's probably a good time to retire that, that uh, word and try to explain more clearly what we mean. Well, um, you know, we, it, it still strikes me as just extraordinary that the economy has, it's, it's long past recovery, we're in a full-blown expansion Unemployment's down to 4.6. We have record high asset prices. Housing is leading the way to the point where, in many markets, houses are just unaffordable for many people. And yet, the Fed's going to purchase $35 billion in mortgage-backed securities in December alone, and scheduled to continue purchasing mortgage-backed securities for the months on end. I, I would strongly urge you to reconsider the pace of the tapering. Um, 
Secretary Yellen, I want to follow up on the uh, discussion about payment stable coins. In the President's working group, payment stable coins were defined. And the definition is, and I quote, those stable coins that are designed to maintain a stable value relative to a fiat currency and therefore have the potential, potential to be used as a widespread means of payment, end quote. End quote. Well, that certainly covers every major stable coin that exists right now. And what strikes me as perplexing is that the President's Working Group recommendation is that all such stable coins be required to be issued by depository institutions only. But yet, as you know, the mechanism by which the value of the stable coin is maintained relative to a fiat currency, they vary significantly. Some some arguably look somewhat like depository institutions. Others look much more like money market accounts. Still others look like something wholly new. Why suggest that they all must be regulated the same way and treated as depository institutions? Well, they, they all have the potential to be used as a means of payment, um, regardless of how they um, are used at the outset when they're introduced. And um, the structure that they um, espouse and, and um, adhere to, which is that they have a stable value relative to a fiat currency, that is really what depository institutions guarantee. Um, I, I would just suggest that we really think this through. I, I think the very fundamentally different designs suggest that there might be different regulatory approaches. I'm going to run out of time here. So, Mr. Chairman, I just want to note that pillar one of the Biden administration's international tax agreement will be the most significant international tax change in 100 years. To implement it, every one of our bilateral trade, uh, I'm sorry, our bilateral tax treaties would need to be modified. There is no historical precedent for bypassing the Senate treaty process to implement pillar one. Secretary Yellen, during a recent Finance Committee briefing, I asked you to acknowledge that administration would need to come to the Senate for treaty approval to implement Pillar 1. You responded that Treasury has yet to determine whether a treaty will be needed or not. In my view, and that of many of my colleagues, implementing Pillar 1 would require modifications to our existing bilateral tax treaties, and those modifications must be approved by two-thirds of the Senate. The executive branch cannot ignore the Senate on a matter that is clearly our constitutional responsibility. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks, Senator Chairman. Senator Reid is recognized from Rhode Island. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, first, let me thank uh, Secretary Yellen for being our guest speaker at the Providence Chamber of Commerce last week. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you. And I learned something uh, there. I always do when I'm with the Secretary. Uh, she is the only person that has been chairman of the President's Council on Economic Advisors. Chairman of the Federal Reserve and Secretary of the Treasury. So thank you, Madam Secretary, for your work. And let me, uh, Chairman Powell, extend my congratulations for your reappointment to the Federal Reserve. Thank you. Chairman Powell, uh, we've seen, as you both discussed, a steady job growth. Uh, what is troubling, though, is the labor participation rate has uh, remained depressed. And until we get that uh, participation rate up higher, we're going to have the complaint that we receive, uh, the inability to get workers, et cetera. Uh, how do we do that? And what's the, what do you think are the causes of this fall off in the participation rate? I didn't catch the very end of that. Uh, the causes of the fall in the participation rate, and then how do we rectify those causes? So it, it's very surprising. Since June of last year, the unemployment rate has dropped 6.5%, and participation has basically moved up to two-tenths. It's sort of moved sideways, which was surprising. I think when um, unemployment insurance, uh, enhanced unemployment insurance ran off and schools reopened and vaccination came, we all thought there would be a, a significant increase in labor supply, and it hasn't happened. Uh, so you ask why. There's tremendous uncertainty around that, but a big part of it is clearly linked to the ongoing pandemic. People answer surveys and, and they, you know, they're reluctant to go back to work. They're reluctant to, uh, to leave their caregiving responsibilities and go back to work because they feel like schools might be closing again, things like that. So it's an issue. And I, th I think what we're taking, what I'm taking on board is that it's gonna take longer to get labor force, force participation back. We're not going right back to the same economy. And um, 
really it's going to take, a, often labor force participation is a lagging indicator. It follows big improvements in, in the unemployment rate. And that's, we're probably on track to have that happen. And that means to get back to the kind of great labor market we had before the pandemic, we're going to need a long expansion. To get that, we're going to need price stability. And in a sense, uh, the risk of, of persistent high inflation is also a major risk to, to getting back to such a labor market. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Secretary, let me uh, thank you for your maximizing the flexibility in the emergency rental assistance program. Uh, steps like self-attestation and uh, bulk utility payments have been very helpful to Rhode Islanders trying to get these returns. One area, though, is, is very difficult, and it always seems difficult. That is the homeless population. Of, okay, can you look at and try to uh, develop the, the ERA guidelines to emphasize how funds can be appropriately used for homelessness? That's an extremely important area. We're very focused on it, and we'll be happy to work with you on it. What I can say is that um, ERA funds can be used to provide um, so-called housing stability services, a range of services to the homeless um, to help them find a stable shelter. Um, something that Treasury did, um, a kind of flexibility that we built into our guidelines is um, ERA statute requires that to be eligible um, for assistance, a household has to have a so-called rental obligation. Um, recognizing that would be something that would be challenging for families experiencing homelessness, we created um, an opportunity for ERA grantees um, to provide individuals with a letter of intent to pay a rental obligation. So with this letter of intent, that would make it easy, easier for the homeless to be able to secure housing. So those are two forms of flexibility we think will help and we'd be glad to work with you to see if we can identify more. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And on communicating uh, those provisions to local authorities would be helpful. And just a, a final point, Secretary Yellen, this is with the Homeowner Assistance Fund. Uh, I know you're looking at the state plans, uh, and if you could uh, accelerate that to get the money out, uh, because uh, as you well know, a lot of these moratoriums on uh, eviction are either gone or going, and it would be very helpful to get the money out. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks, Senator Reed. Senator Crapo of Idaho is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Yellen, some appear to believe that you have announced that unless a debt limit increase or suspension occurs before December 15th, that the Treasury uh, faces imminent default. Uh, that's not how I've read your comments. So it would be helpful for you to clarify what your current projection is for when Treasury would run out of headroom to operate below the debt limit and run dangerously low of operating cash. Uh, I also request that Treasury provide details of its latest debt and cash projections to the Finance Committee and look forward to receiving those projections. Yes, let, let me clarify what I said. Um, what I indicated in my most recent letter to Congress is that I have a high degree of confidence the Treasury will be able to finance the U.S. government through December 15th, but there would be scenarios in which Treasury would not have sufficient funds to continue to finance the operations of the U.S. government beyond that date. Um, I would note that on December 15th, um, Treasury will invest um, f funds um, from the infrastructure bill um, and that will use up $118 billion worth of uh, capacity when those funds are uh, from the Highway Trust Fund are invested in government securities. And um, I, I did 
didn't say that there is no way that um, we can make it past December 15th. There are a range, there's uncertainty about what our cash balance will be and our, our resources. Um, right now, there is uncertainty about where we will be on December 15th. And there are scenarios in which it, we can see it would not be possible to finance the government. That doesn't mean that um, there are not also scenarios in which we can, but um, we, we think it's important for Congress to recognize that we may not be able to, and therefore to raise the debt ceiling expeditiously. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Chair Powell, the inflation hit 6.2% last month, which is the highest in more than three decades. Still, the administration is pushing for support of a nearly $2 trillion social spending package. And by the way, that number even accepts their budget gimmicks that uh, hide real costs that could mean several trillion more in spending over the next 10 years. Most of that spending does nothing to ameliorate the problems of rising, uh, of rising inflation. In fact, will simply add fuel to the inflation fire. I'm very concerned that the administration is not taking inflation's threat seriously, and in the case of energy prices, is enacting regulatory policies that themselves are threats. Do you agree that inflation is a serious threat to our economy, and how do you intend to address inflation? I do think that the, the threat of persistently higher inf inflation has grown. I think um, the ba my baseline expectation is still, as I mentioned, and of most forecasters, is still that inflation will move back down over the course of next year closer to our target. But clearly the risk of more persistent inflation has risen. And I think you, what you've seen is you've seen us, you've seen our policy adapt and you'll see it continue to adapt. You know, we, we will use our tools to make sure that higher inflation does not become entrenched. I noted in your uh, in opening statement that you indicated that inflation pressures will linger well into next year. You do stand by that? Yes, I think we can now see um, certainly through the middle of next year. That's an expectation. You know, we're, uh, forecasting is, is uh, not, a, not a perfect art, as you may have noticed. Uh, so. But yes, right into the middle of next year, and um, you know, I, I, that's our expectation. But of course, what's happened is that data has been pushed out repeatedly, as uh, supply side problems have have uh, not really improved. And if uh, if Congress were to pass an additional two trillion plus in spending, uh, mixed with a number of increases in taxes, would that add to inflationary pressures? Senator, I'm sorry to. I'll just. Uh, just note that we have a long-standing policy of not commenting on, on uh, active legislation, as you probably aren't surprised to hear. I suspected that. One last very quick question, uh, and for you, Chair Powell. You've uh, indicated that there would be a report by the Fed on its discussion paper relating to digital, digital currencies, and that's been delayed several times. My question to you is, when can we expect the Fed's report, and are there reasons for that delay? I, I would think uh, very soon. Uh, I mean, in, certainly in coming weeks. And you know, the reasons are just trying to get it right and trying to find the time to get it right. It's been a very busy time, as you as you will know. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Chris. Senator Warner, Virginia is recognized. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's good to see you, Secretary Yellen, and congratula congratulations, Chair Powell, on your your reappointment. I want to start with you, Chair Powell. I mean, I actually think the Fed's activities. Um, particularly during the pandemic, which included both extensive use of 13 3 facilities and uh, some aggressive bond purchases, actually helped stave off what could have been a complete economic meltdown. And while we did spend in excess of $5 trillion, mostly all in an extraordinarily bipartisan way under both President Trump and President Biden on recovery from COVID, uh, I think history will treat those actions, certain areas, excessive. Uh, but I think net-net, from a historical perspective, it'll be well regarded uh, both for the American economy and for the world's economy. But I think, as you've, as you've indicated, Chair Powell, um, you know, I think we're seeing our economy come back. Uh, we will differ on, on uh, 
the bipartisan infrastructure plan and maybe even the, a bit of the Build Back Better, but um, that's part of our job. But I have seen since your FOMC's November meeting that the Fed signaled a shift announcing starting to move back from some of the very aggressive means you've used and announcing a ta tapering on the pace of bond purchases month by month as the economy continues to strengthen. I'd like you to get into that a little bit. Which factors most influence that decision for a gradual change in course? And how long do you think it'll take the Fed to gradually wind down these purchases? So we, we actually haven't made a decision on that, but, but I, I would just say this. The most recent data, particularly since <coughs> the um, November FOMC meeting, show elevated inflation pressures, a rapid improvement in many labor market indicators without an accompanying addition of, of, uh, of labor supply, and also strong spending that, that, that really signals uh, growth, big, significant growth in coming months. Remember that every dollar of asset purchases actually adds accommodation to the economy. But, but at this point, the economy is very strong and inflationary pressures are high, and, and it is therefore appropriate, in my view, to consider wrapping up the taper of our asset purchases, which we actually announced at the November meeting perhaps a few months sooner. And I expect that we will discuss that at, at our upcoming meeting in a couple of weeks. Of course, between now and then, we will see another labor market report, another inflation report, and we'll also get a better sense of, of the, new, uh, the new COVID variant as well before, that, before we make that decision. Well, let, let me drill down on that a little bit. I mean, um, clearly, I think I was surprised. You say you were surprised. I think most of us were surprised that coming back in September uh, that we didn't see more folks re-enter the, um, the labor force. Uh, I believe that tapering and, frankly, accelerating it um, can kind of serve as an insurance policy if, if we don't see this return and we see these potential over, overheating of the, um, of the economy. Um, so I do hope that you will move more aggressively on this tapering. Uh, I also would like to just touch again, you mentioned some of the new variants with COVID. Um, what factors, one of the things we've got to maintain is some ability to move quickly. And we obviously, Congress moved very quickly uh, under President Trump and Secretary Mnuchin um, with the outset of, of COVID. Hopefully we won't have to come back to those kind of actions from this entity. But with these new variants coming, coming on board, how will, what are the markers you're going to look at to determine uh, uh, how that might influence Fed activity? So at this point, I, I think we're all looking at the same thing, and we're listening to the experts, which, which are not, I'm certainly not one of those, but I talk to those people, and it's really about transmissibility. It's about the ability of the existing uh, vaccines to, to address a new, any new variant, and it's about the severity of the disease once it is contracted. And we, we don't know, I think we're going to know, I'm, what I'm told by experts is that we'll know quite a bit about those answers within about a month. We'll know something, though, within a week or 10 days. And then, if, then, then and only then can we make an assessment of what the impact would be on the economy. As I pointed out in my testimony, for now, it's a risk. It's, it's, not, it's a risk to the baseline. It's not really baked into our forecast. Well, I, I'm down to my last 20-odd seconds. I'm not going to get away without at least raising an issue I always raise with Secretary Yellen, and I know Chairman Powell have raised with you as well. And that's, I think, the very smart action that took place again, actually, under President Trump, uh, on investment in CDFIs and minority depository institutions. And I want to thank Chairman Brown and people like Senator Crapo and so many others, including Secretary Mnuchin, that we made that investment. And you now, Secretary Yellen, are implementing that. We've seen a great take-up rate from the ESIT program in terms of Tier 1 capital investment into these institutions that hit low and, minor, low and moderate income individuals. I guess um, with this demand way exceeding... Um, the amount of money we had, what else can we do to shore up these institutions? And I would love to press both of you. Maybe you can take this partially for the record since I've gone over on how we might even be able to look at securitization of some of this CDFI debt so that we can, again, increase the liquidity of these institutions. But if you briefly, recognizing I've gone over, uh, answer that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, we would be glad to work with you to discuss possibilities there. Um, I, I think that the infusion of funds into CDFIs and MDIs, it's historic. It's going to make a tremendous 
difference to their ability to um, support businesses, uh, particularly in um, minority areas. Um, we've seen huge take up of the um, ESIP uh, funds that have been provided. It's $4 billion oversubscribed. We're working through applications and we'll try to make decisions on investments um, shortly, but it certainly shows that it's a program that has the potential to make an enormous difference to this lending. We would be happy to work with you to find ways to make it uh, yet more effective. I'm way over time. If you could just say yes, you'll work with me too, Chair Powell. That would be great. Yes, I'll work with you too. <laughs> Senator Rounds from South Dakota is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, Chairman Powell, uh, congratulations on your renomination. I do look forward to supporting your nomination. I think you've uh, provided stability during a very challenging time. Um, Secretary Yellen, uh, it's good to see you once again, and I thank you for your service to our country. Uh, in September, when you were before this committee, I asked you when you would say enough is enough when it comes to our debt and deficit. You acknowledged that debt becomes an issue when it exceeds 100 percent of GDP, a level we have already hit, as you know, but said also that since the cost of servicing our debt has been negative due to a long stretch of low rates, our debt has been less burdensome. However, due to skyrocketing inflation, I think it's just a matter of time before we exit this very low interest rate environment. Do you think, uh, uh, Secretary Yellen, do you think it's finally time to start sounding some alarm bells with regard to the financing of our national debt? Well, I wouldn't want to sound alarm, alarm bells. I think that we are in a sustainable debt path, but um, President Biden was very clear um, when he proposed the Build Back Better um, plan that it should be fully financed uh, as the infrastructure bill was. And that is what CBO found, that um, the fiscal plans that uh, the Biden administration have put forth in infrastructure and Build Back Better will um, not worsen the debt or deficit path, and indeed by the end of the 10-year horizon, Build Back Better lowers deficits, and um, it yields um, very great benefits beyond the 10-year horizon, particularly from the investment um, in the IRS to enhance its ability to close the tax gap and to collect um, revenues that are due under our tax code. But I, but so it is a fiscally responsible plan uh, that makes matters better rather than but worse. Ma Madam Secretary, I guess the, the reason for my question is that it's not just a matter of whether or not we have a half a trillion dollars or so that will have to be financed or more during a 10-year time period as that money comes back in for paying for programs that are four to five years in, in duration under the proposal. But rather, we have $29 trillion plus dollars that will not only be refinanced during a time period, but may very well be refinanced at a higher rate. Uh, in fact, Treasuries right now have run anywhere from 1.54 to 1.42 percent over the last couple of days. But they're going to trend upwards. And in fact, there are some people that would suggest that Treasuries may very well hit 3 to 3.5 3, to 3, or 3 percent over the next 18 months. Do you think that would be a reasonable expectation? The, the forecasts uh, that were included most recently in the mid-session review assume that